this is, uh, I'm going to talk about something I've been working on for the last maybe year and a half. Uh, it's a project called Sync. Uh, and so the description is, it's a new protocol for distributed, fault-tolerant, bandwidth-sensitive IoT systems. Uh, and so for people who are watching the video uh, and for you in the audience, uh, I tried to put some buzzwords up here. Um, please laugh again at the jokes. We had a little mishap at the beginning. But so IoT, Internet of Things, uh, machine, to machine communication is M2M. Edge computing, or fog computing, which you heard earlier. <laughs> uh, Event-based systems, uh, and then eventual consistency. And a little bit more specifically, we're going to talk about NERVs. We're going to talk about MQTT, uh, which, can I get a show of hands of like people who work with or have heard of MQTT? OK, now I see why people are here. Great. Uh, well, we're def we're de I'm definitely going to talk about that. So you came to the right place. Uh, something called CoAP also, uh, a little bit of Kafka, Phoenix channels, and then TCP. So let's dive in. Uh, but first, uh, I just want to kind of outline some of the takeaways that I hope you get, which are what are some of the challenges of IoT device communication? What are some of the options that you have for communicating with devices? Uh, and then lastly, or third, what are some of the custom approaches we at SparkMeter have explored with our solution Sync? Uh, and lastly, this is ElixirConf, you know, how does this all fit in? Uh, so, hello. My name is Mike Wode. Uh, I work for a company called SparkMeter, which probably very, very few of you have heard about, but um, SparkMeter offers grid management solutions that enable utilities in emerging markets to run financially sustainable, efficient, and reliable systems. Got to make sure I stay on brand here. So what does that mean? Well, we sort of have three lines of business. We design and we sell smart meters for electricity metering. So these will uh, measure electricity used, um, some information about how stable the grid is, uh, and they will also receive signals to turn on or off, to limit the load, uh, update firmware. Um, there's a lot going on in these things. We also sell grid management software, kind of a SaaS to, to manage your grid. Um, so we can handle the software part of it and let our operator partners really focus on generating, distributing, electricity, and then uh, interacting with our customers. Uh, and lastly, there's some digital solutions I won't really talk about. Um, and so we operate in emerging markets. So this is typically Africa or Southeast Asia, uh, which makes it really interesting. The project was actually started in Haiti. Uh, and the idea was through automation and more efficient grid operation, we can lower the cost to deliver electricity to people uh, and increase the amount of people in the world who have uh, access to electricity and good access to electricity, which is also important. Um, so we've been around for a while. We sell to more than 25 countries. Uh, and this meter sold number is old. I apologize. It's definitely higher than that now. But it says more than 120,000, so still accurate. Uh, and lastly, just earlier this year, uh, we got an award from Fast Company as one of the most innovative uh, companies in energy, which was pretty cool. So this is the project I work on, which is our next generation base station. It's this blue box in the middle here. And kind of the way this thing works is we have these smart meters on the left, which uh, operate in a mesh uh, communication, again, uh, hearkening back to our keynote, uh, which is kind of interesting, interesting to hear. Uh, and they all talk to each other and then eventually to the space station wirelessly. So the space station at a site will have tens, hundreds, thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of meters it talks to. Uh, so the base station kind of collects that, does some processing. We actually run billing on the base station. and It'll have all these messages that it wants to send up to the cloud. And then the cloud will you know, have behaviors it wants to send to the base station, uh, all kinds of communication going back and forth. And the base station runs Elixir, NERVs, which we've been super happy with. Uh, and we also have some Rust for some performance sensitive stuff. Uh, and then in the servers, for the communication end, we run Elixir. We have some separate services, which you know, run other stuff like Python or things you would expect. Um, but mostly everything here is Elixir. So you'll hear in this talk, I'll, I'll talk about the ground, which it, I'm usually referring to then the base station, and then the cloud, uh, which is the cloud. Uh, and the question mark. Uh, very relevant. Uh, I really enjoyed the keynote, because uh, that's a lot of where I work, uh, is just kind of, well, what's in between here? And that's going to be the subject of this talk. So. That's a little bit about uh, who I am, what we do. Uh, let me get into the problem a little bit more, which is that messages need to go in both directions. We need to talk from the ground to the cloud to send meter readings up to the cloud to you know, ship them out to whatever. Uh, and then from the cloud, or someone makes a payment, we need to send that then down to the ground. 
network and power losses are frequent. Uh, often they look like the same thing too, which is even worse. Um, but so that's a big challenge that we have to deal with. Uh, we also want visibility into device connectivity. We want to know if a device is offline so we can bro be proactive and tell our operator partners that, hey, we haven't heard from this device in you know, two hours. Why don't you go check on it? Uh, and you know, certainly hinted in the talk description, data is expensive. Uh, so let me just give you some hypothetical numbers of what that might actually mean. Let's say we're paying 40 cents um, per megabyte. And I think I mentioned this is, these devices talk over cellular. So data can be very expensive. Uh, and let's say we have 100,000 meters, and those meters consume one megabyte per meter per month at 40 cents per megabyte. Well, that can be $40,000 per month. Uh, and now if you have a protocol that is really verbose or chatty, you can imagine doubling that or 10xing that. Uh, and if you have a protocol that's good, you can cut that by uh, some factor. So that's why this is important. Um, and just to give you an idea of also how frequently we lose network uh, or power, these are two different sites, both in rural Kenya. Uh, green, of course, means it's connected, and then the red means it's been disconnected. Uh, up top, this site is very good. Uh, below, that is much worse, uh, although it's been online for more than a day solid, which is good. Um, so we need to deal with both the best case and the worst case here. Given that background, you know, let's kind of evaluate some of the solutions that are out there. Uh, I'm going to rank them by these criteria here. Industry support is if I go to Stack Overflow or a blog or, you know, just the documentation, can I read this? If we hire someone, do they have, like, some idea of what it is? Uh, and bad would be, of course, none of that. Bidirectional messaging, can we send the message? Uh, if not, do we have to build something on top of that to do this? Um, device visibility, same thing. Can we see that the device is connected, or do we have to build some sort of heartbeat? Uh, delivery confirmation, if we send a message to the device, how do we know that the device actually got it? Um, do we have to do this, or will the solution handle this for us? Data efficiency, uh, and then supporting infrastructure. What do we have to stand up in production to actually let this thing run? Um, how much work does it take to keep it running? Uh, and then if we have developers that want to run this locally, which we do, how much work is it for them to do that? Because if there's a lot of friction, they're probably not going to do that, um, and it's going to be harder to catch bugs and debug stuff. So with that, uh, we looked you know, at REST, something called CoAP, uh, MQTT, Kafka, and then lastly, WebSockets and Phoenix Channels. So we'll start with REST. Um, needs no introduction, rep representational state transfer. Uh, obviously, it just uh, there's a client that makes an HTTP request over TCP to a web server uh, and gets an HTTP response. Uh, so industry support, very good. Bidirectional messaging, um, bad for our use case because it's easy to go from the base station to the cloud, but to go from the cloud back, uh, there's ways of doing it, but we basically can't make that request. Um, device visibility is also bad because you might know the last time you got a re re request or response, um, but you have to build on some sort of heartbeat to know that the device is still there. Not that big a challenge, but it's just one more thing you have to do. Um, delivery confirmation, though, is very good because it's essentially synchronous. Um, supporting infrastructure, also good, assuming you already have the web server running. Uh, and data efficiency, big sob, no surprise there, because you're setting up this TCP connection, you're tearing it down, and you have all this extra HTTP data uh, in the frame, which you, know, you don't really need. Um, so something called CoAP, which is really interesting, this constrained application protocol. Has anybody heard of this? All right. <laughs> um, it's, it's pretty neat. It's worth reading about just because they have some interesting ideas. Um, it's, it's kind of like REST for constrained devices, um, and it operates over UDP. Uh, the spec is very well written. Uh, it didn't work for us for a lot of the same reasons of REST. Um, and also, although the spec is well written, uh, there isn't a ton of its support for it in like libraries and stuff. Um, bidirectional messaging, sort of the same story, although there's something called bidirectional co-app. It's not clear if that's like supported by the spec or the library, whatever. I didn't look into it too, too much. Uh, device visibility, same problem as REST. Uh, delivery confirmation is a little better because co-app has this interesting thing where when you make a request, you can actually send a flag of like, this request needs a response, uh, or it doesn't. And when the server sends the response, it can say, here's my response, pass fail, error because of this reason. Or it can say, 
my response is that I'm going to give you a response, and here's a token of that future response, and it'll match it up later. So kind of interesting. Um, supporting infrastructure, also pretty good, because it doesn't need anything uh, in between to stand up. Uh, data efficiency, also pretty good. Uh, OK, MQTT, the 800-pound gorilla. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with this, the idea is you have this MQTT broker kind of in the middle, um, and all these clients connect and talk to it over the MQTT protocol uh, using TCP. And the clients will subscribe to topics and also publish method messages on those topics to the broker, which then are propagated through PubSub to any currently listening client. Key distinction there. So industry support is good, of course. You know, AWS, Google, Microsoft all uh, have brokers that you can run. Um, it's been a while since I looked at since I looked at this, but they were running support for 3.1, but not everything there. Uh, MQTT5 has some more interesting stuff. It didn't look like that was supported um, by the big guys. There are some options for that. Uh, and of course, MQTT4, well, we don't talk about MQTT4. It's complicated. Uh, Bidirectional mes messaging, though, is very good. Um, easy to send messages to the broker and, and get them back. Uh, Tortoise is a great library for this. Um, Device visibility, though, is bad, uh, particularly for our use case. And this was something that uh, kind of annoyed me, which is that, you know, there's like this last will and testament message in MQTT, which is helpful. But really, um, we ended up having to build essentially session tracking on top of this. Because you might, you know from the client that you're connected to the MQTT broker. But for us, we don't know if the base station then is connected. The base station has to broadcast a message, message that says, hey, I'm connected. Uh, and we have to build tracking on top of that. Uh, so that was just kind of an uh, extra tedious step for us. Uh, kind of similar is this issue of delivery confirmation, where the client will get a confirmation from the MQTT broker that it got the message. Uh, but you know, just because the broker got the message doesn't mean that the device on the other end got it. The classic example of this is um, if no one is subscribed to the message, it's like a tree falling in the woods and no one hears it. So on, as the cloud, we might send a message to the broker, but the device isn't actually listening, so it wasn't there. So we have to build this whole tracking system on top of it. Um, and I'd be curious to hear from people afterwards if they've had the same problem. Seems to be uh, a common request response uh, problem that people solve in MQTT themselves. Uh, supporting infrastructure, kind of a frowny face because you have to stand up this broker. Uh, if you want to run something locally, you have to run Mosquito, which is an open source broker, versus what's, whatever's running in the cloud, and they're not the same thing. Uh, but data efficiency is good, so that's good. Kafka, uh, not going to talk about this too much uh, or explain it too much. I found this really good article from Confluent, which was basically talking about some of the cons of Kafka for IoT, and they specifically say it requires a stable network connection and solid infrastructure, which we don't have. Uh, they also say it lacks IoT specific features. Uh, and then they go on to basically just tell you to use MQTT. Um, but so if we did look at it, you know, it's mostly pretty good. Um, they don't essentially throw away a message if no one's listening, which I liked. Uh, but standing up a Kafka instance doesn't seem very fun or easy. So I gave it a really big sob. Uh, lastly, the one that's relevant to us is uh, Phoenix channels or WebSockets. Uh, this is nice just because there's nothing in between where the client connects over WebSockets to a web server. Uh, supposedly, one web server can handle like 2 million connections or something, I hear. Uh, and so industry support is very good. Uh, of course, it enables bidirectional messaging, uh, good device visibility. Uh, delivery confirmation is bad because you still have to build something on top if the connection goes away. Not the end of the world, but just one more thing to do. Infrastructure is good because you don't have anything in the middle. Uh, and the efficiency is also pretty good because you can send binary messages. Um, I also pulled the Google Trends for these, just uh, curious. Um, it's pretty much what you'd expect. REST is most popular, then Kafka uh, and WebSockets. Uh, and MQTT and CoAP are kind of trailing behind. Um, it's actually interesting that it's been pretty steady, uh, although for some reason it went down. I don't know if Google changed their algorithm. Who knows? So given all that, what is sync? Why did we do this thing ourselves? What are we doing? How are we solving things? Well, first of all, we have this cool logo, which I was very happy with. Everybody needs a logo. 
Um, so I mean, it's, it's really pretty simple. We just run a TCP server, and we have this custom binary protocol, uh, and clients connect, and they send messages, and they get messages back. Um, so it uses Ranch, which, is which was really nice, because we're already running web servers on these uh, both devices and in the cloud. Um, so in the cloud, which runs the TCP server, you know, we didn't need to add anything. We already had Ranch because we have Cowboy, because we have Phoenix. Uh, so that right there saved us a bunch of code. Uh, and we know Ranch works great. Um, we are also able to use mutual TLS authentication. So the devices have their own SSL certs. Uh, the cloud has its own SSL cert. And when they connect, we know that each one is who they say they are. Uh, we don't have to deal with like username and passwords. We don't have to deal with like bearer tokens. Um, all that stuff is basically done for us. Um, and Elixir is great for this. Uh, and then we have hooks into the app for peer authentication that we do additionally. Uh, and we can send messages when the TCP connection goes up or down. Um, we also have keep alive messages, kind of like WebSockets, to tell us if the, if the client's still there. Um, and really, most of what we use for this is uh, publishing a message, much like MQTT. Uh, and then we have built in, and this is important, batch publishing. So the protocol itself, if you give it a bunch of messages, will take that and figure out the most efficient way to encode that and send it. And I'll talk a little bit more th about that in a few minutes. Um, there's probably more coming, but so far that's all we've needed. Uh, so this slide is, I find it very boring, but uh, it's important because I'll explain why in a second. Basically what a sync message is, is there's a key, much like a key value store or a primary key. Uh, it's just some binary. Some event type ID, which is an integer. And if you combine the key and the event type ID, you essentially get a topic. Uh, but it's much less verbose than something like MQTT or Kafka. Um, and we also built in schema versions. So we know as we add data to the system, um, as we evolve our schemas, we want to make sure we're explicit about which version of that we're sending. So that's actually built into the protocol. Uh, and we also have timestamp built in uh, as a Unix timestamp. Uh, so anything that is not any of that is then considered to be the payload. Uh, so that's just some binary. It could be thrift. It could be um, protocol buffers. We use something called Avro. You could just, I don't know, use strings. You could use JSON. You do you. Um, so the really neat thing about this is because the protocol knows uh, all this extra data, it can then pull it out. And you give sync essentially row level data. And then sync turns that into column oriented data. And that column oriented data will compress much better than the row oriented data. Um, and so also just kind of once you publish a message we have built in, you either get an ACK, which means, hey, I got this and it's OK, or a NACK, which I got this and it's bad for these reasons. Um, so given our criteria before, how do we do? Well, industry support, that's a big sob. Industry support, you're basically, you know, you're looking at it, me and a few other people. Um, but hey, everything else we did great. So I'll take it. Um, you guys want to see some benchmarks? Yes. So I pulled these together Sunday. Uh, I took one event, which is 60 bytes, which is about the most we send, uh, trying to give some worst case data here. So REST, it took 600 bytes roughly, or 10x the amount of data we actually want to send uh, using JSON. Binary was only a little better. Uh, MQTT was uh, 4x, and that's because we're sending a message out and back. Uh, and then sync, we were actually able to do almost 2x, just a little better. So that felt really good. Um, but then we want to kick it up a notch, of course. Let's talk about batches. So I took a batch of 100 events, that same 60 bytes. Uh, and I really tried to randomize the data so we couldn't cheat with compression. Uh, so MQTT, you basically, you're losing a lot of the protocol overhead at that point. Um, so it's, it's almost 1x the amount that you're sending. And I, I just put together some ba custom batching of how you would lump these all together. Um, and if you use zip, uh, my randomization was good, so we didn't actually save that much. Uh, that was a good confirmation when I was doing benchmarks. Uh, and then with sync, we're actually able to do better than the original um, 60 bytes just by doing that column-based uh, encoding and by knowing if, there, if something is sent the whole time, we can just send it once. Uh, and then if we actually send it less random data, which will compress well, because we structure it better again, we can outcompete uh, just something with like MQTT. So that felt really good. Um, 
So that is the end. Let me check how we're doing on time. Cool. It's the end of the easy stuff. We're about to get to the tough stuff. <laughs> and I'm going to warn you, it's going to get a little crazy. <laughs> so the real problem is that we have a distributed system. You know, it's writing a binary protocol and like encoding messages, it's a ton of fun and you can really feel like you're doing something. But um, at the end of the day, the problem is much more challenging than that. We have these base stations on the ground that talk to the cloud and each one is kind of its own special case. Uh, so an example of this is, um, think about like an IoT thermostat where you can change the temperature from the cloud or the ground, but the system is disconnected. Someone on the ground changes it from 65 degrees, 65 Fahrenheit for our, just to be specific here, um, from 65 to 60 on the ground, and then someone in the cloud changes it from 65 to 70. Uh, you probably in the cloud want to know that the state on the ground was 65 degrees and you're trying to change it to 70, so you have to keep track of where the system has diverged. And then when it comes back in sync, you have to keep track of, well, what do I do? Do I change it to 60? Do I change it to 70? Like, how do I even think about this? And how do I make sure that messages still go out while we try and find, figure this out? So all that to say, um, we need to know the state of the other system. We need to have some sort of way of doing conflict-free replication. Um, and then for us, additionally, we want to be able to protect, prioritize certain messages um, such that if a uh, base station has been offline for you know, a couple days, it's going to have a ton of data to send. But we have, probably have more important things that we want to send first. So we really mess with message ordering here, um, and that can cause some unexpected uh, things to surface in the UI. How do we deal with that? Uh, schema evolution, this is kind of the case where um, you might, on your, on your devices, be running multiple versions of firmware across your fleet. Uh, so you have to figure out, well, which version do I send to this device? Which version do I send to that device? Uh, and additionally, you want to be able to deploy to the cloud and have your messages be understood by the firmware, even if you hadn't sent an update. So that's a big challenge we're trying to solve with Sync. Uh, and lastly, there's this idea of poison messages. And these are, these are those things that get into your system. Um, Justin was talking about this a little bit kind of today, where you have something, I always think of it like an emoji. Someone put an emoji in your system and you just can't deal with someone putting like fire or something and it just crashes your system. And if it crashes at once, that's fine because we have these supervision trees. But you know, if you keep sending that message over and over and over, uh, it's gonna keep crashing and potentially bring down your whole system. So in the context of this exchanging data between the cloud and the ground, can we build in dead litter queues to the protocol so that if one of these people, one of these systems writes a bad message, um, it doesn't break the connection. So all this to say, I drew this really early in the project uh, and this was, uh, what I really wanted was, we have this idea of you know, the base station firmware with its own internal queue and the cloud application with its own internal queue. And what I really wanted was just someone in the middle that I can make it their problem and I would just say, here's the event, you figure out how to send it, you figure out how to do it efficiently. Um, I'm too worried about like this meter over here or like exposing this API, like I don't wanna have to deal with this. So the way I think about sync is that if MQTT and Kafka had a baby, I don't know what it would look like, maybe like this, who knows. Um, but so kind of taking this idea of the fine-grained topics of MQTT that can be really specific um, which Kafka, Kafka doesn't like, and then this persisted event log of Kafka, uh, and kind of combining them together. Um, also keeping the idea of subscriptions from both, um, and allowing for synchronous and asynchronous operation. Um, so if you worked with like Kafka or other event-based systems, this should be kind of familiar. Sync uses this idea of an event log, where um, let's say meter readings would come in, the first meter reading would be offset one, each sub subsequent one would be essentially an auto-incrementing ID. Um, and similarly, if you have changes to a user's user where the first one is one, you change their name, user two, and so on. Um, that's useful because then you can build off of that with um, event subscriptions. And bef what used to be your queue going out to each base station um, where you would take every event or message and put it into each queue, you can now essentially have pointers and you know where your system is in terms of replication. Um, and all of that, of course, is persisted in the data store. 
one of the other things, other things that kind of annoys me about MQTT is like you have these subscriptions and then you also have to track them somewhere else and then you have to make sure that's in sync. Uh, so I didn't want to have that again with um, this solution. Uh, additionally, there's configurable priority where we can send um, meter readings last because that's typically the most data and what we don't need as much uh, for online transaction processing kind of stuff. Um, you can configure transmission behavior. So, you know, like let's say something has changed a lot and a base station just came online. Well, let's only send them the most recent one. We don't need to send them old data. Uh, and we can also have retention parameters where we can say, let's keep the last 100 events for this, for each meter or something like that. Uh, and then as the system chugs along, uh, that's really good for managing uh, the amount of disk space used on the system. So given all that, uh, kind of the retrospective here, was this a good idea? Let's start with the reasons against so we can end on a happy note. Um, the big one here is that uh, it's custom. You know, it's, it's something we built, something we maintain. Uh, there's a high bus factor, certainly. Um, we're also kind of still figuring out some of the right trade-offs and how to scale this. Um, and if you've worked with immutable data, you probably know it's a bit of a blessing and a curse. You know that no one has changed this for the most part, but if someone does something and they you know, commit a plain text password or there's some bug that changes how something is calculated, you gotta go and figure out, well, do I build something on top of this to now correct for that? Do I go in and like perform surgery on these records? Um, it's a bit of a challenge there. Uh, also these event logs, you know, it's, it's kind of like Cassandra or something like that where you don't have foreign keys or secondary indices. Um, so if you have to query into that, um, you might have to do essentially a table scan. Um, there's also this question of like, how do we deal with people that depend on this? Um, if the system's been offline for a while and it comes online, um, it has a lot of data to send, and if you look at the system at that point, it's gonna look weird. Um, how do we deal with, it's, it's kind of the, the thing about error handling, which is if you handle this error, your system's in a weird state, and then how do you actually like express that to people? Uh, and it's easy to think upfront about, oh, we'll just handle this error, but like, what does that mean to people? Um, we often think about too late. Um, additionally, uh, you know, if you've worked with event-based systems, you know that event ordering between topics is complicated. Uh, if you have something in one topic and that depends on something else, uh, you kind of have to figure out, well, do I wait for that? How do I know when this thing actually came in? Um, and, you know, for me, I think about this a lot. Like, at what point am I just re-implementing Kafka? Like, am I really delivering something of value? Should I just switch? Like, how much is the novelty worth it? Um, but so, uh, for the pros, you know, I think one of the things I think about a lot is that we would have had to do most of this anyways. This complexity is already caught in the system, and by pulling it into sync, um, the abstraction is um, relatively easy to understand and reason about. Uh, it mostly keeps it contained, uh, and you know we were using MQTT for a while until I had this whatever crazy idea to do this event-based system. Uh, and when I was pulling out the old code and putting in the new stuff. Uh, it just felt so good to delete the parts of the system which I kind of held my nose at, and you know, they just really annoy you. So that was a really good feeling. Um, and having this event log double as an audit log is also super handy. Um, being able to delete a lot of these audit log tables, and sometimes you're like, I don't know if I need to keep track of this data. Um, once you have it in an event log, um, you know you have it if you need it later. Uh, also, being able to grow the system by adding new events uh, has been great. Uh, we don't have to like make a new endpoint or something. Um, all that infrastructure is basically there for us. Uh, and lastly, sorry, I'm not gonna talk about it, but if you've worked with CD CRDTs, this stuff is really cool. Uh, an event-based system uh, makes that a lot easier. So, kind of where did Elixir help? Well, Nerves has been great. Um, big fans, uh, it's really helped us get this project up fast. Um, everybody who's worked on it uh, has really enjoyed it. Uh, VintageNet has also been super helpful for us for getting the networking working. Uh, and even when there wasn't something that we needed in VintageNet, it was very easy to plug in the, to the abstractions there uh, to get our stuff working. Uh, we also use Nerves Hub to deploy to our Nerves devices, um, and the remote console access is just super helpful. Um, probably, probably my favorite feature of Nerves Hub, tough to say. Um, another thing that really I didn't appreciate, appreciate until I was putting together this talk, which is that being able to share code between the ground and the cloud 
has also helped us move really fast. I don't know if we would have done this without that because we would have had to write this binary encoding and decoding twice, you know, once in C or something like that, and then again in, I don't know, Python or whatever, it's in the cloud. Uh, so being able to have that one library that runs in both uh, has been a big win. Um, next, supervision trees. This has been helpful just for thinking about error handling, but also system bring up. You know, what parts of the system start when? How do we handle things that don't start? Uh, and lastly, working with binaries and TCP connections, uh, I think this would have really intimidated me two years ago or something, but with Elixir, it's pretty much like the best language you can use to solve this problem. So um, I can't imagine having to do this in some other language, but if you have to do it and you're in Elixir, um, you really saved yourself a lot of headaches. So this is the actual end. Uh, I want to say thank you to the audience and the community. Uh, I want to say thank you to uh, SparkMeter for sponsoring me and for having awesome colleagues. I want to say thanks to the Nerves team for an awesome product. Um, and I also want to say thank you to my coworker, Benjamin Milde. Uh, you might know him as Lost Cobra Kai. He and I worked on a lot of this stuff together. Um, and if you haven't read this book by Martin Kleppman, Designing Data Intensive Applications, uh, I highly recommend it. It's very popular on Amazon, so probably a lot of you have read it, but if you haven't, uh, it's very good. So with that, uh, take some questions. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So the way we think about it is the complicated s logic determines whether something has a subscription or not. Um, and then once the subscription exists, the system will then handle what's put where. So the, the firmware or the cloud will determine who gets a subscription to what. Um, and then Sync will say, oh, I have a subscription. I'm going to make sure they're up to date. So a subscription will actually look like this key and event type. Uh, it'll have a consumer offset, which is the last thing it knows it transmitted. Uh, and then it'll have a producer offset, which is like the most current record. So if you're 20 records behind, your producer offset minus your consumer is going to be like 20. That's the way we do it. Um, it's worked for now. We're evaluating some other options just for a couple reasons, but that's the gist of it. Um, John. Yeah, um, so basically we keep track on the connection of the last time we've received a message, and if it goes over a certain amount of time, we send a message, we send a ping. Um, I think the server sends it, um, just so, so we don't... Like yeah, basically. If we haven't had any data, just make sure they're still there. Um, so that's not on the cadence, but when you just detect that the connection might have Yeah, so, yeah. Like, if we haven't heard from them, it's called like a ghost TCP connection or something like that. There's some name for it. We just make sure they're still there. And if it's not, we close the channel. Um, but we only send the ping just because we don't want to send more data than we have to. So you have uh, the ability to send a event log that is part of, of Sync itself. So what I'm curious about is why both of you have separated that out as maybe like a, you know, like a helper library or something like that so you can just use the protocol. Yeah, um, I might not answer your com question completely, but I'll, I'll mostly get to it. Uh, so the event log and the protocol, we have been able to code, so they're pretty separate. Um, we're considering splitting them in two, so you could just use the, the protocol, um, and you wouldn't need to persist anything, or, else, or you could just persist stuff and not use the protocol, or you could use them both together. Um, we store, with the event log, it's also interesting because you get into this sort of like two-phase commit, or like, you know, if you were using Kafka and keeping the events in, the, in Kafka, then you have to deal with like, okay, when did the event actually get committed? Um, so we use like this outbox pattern, which is that we store the event log in the database. So we have the transactional guarantees of the database that the event is actually there, um, which is another nice, I think, advantage. Um, I'm curious what your data story is on the ground. 
Yes, we use SQLite. So, uh, uh, SQLite, or uh, SQLite, some people, some people call it um, potato, potato. Uh, I've learned a lot about that. I'd be very curious to talk to other people who have worked a lot with that, just because um, you working with that realizes how much you take for granted. Something like Postgres gives you. Um, and really puts you more in touch with your, your data patterns and like what the database is actually doing. Is it hard to get SQLite on its own? It's not like it's common like No. Much easier now. Okay. Yes. Cool. Yes, yeah. much easier now. Yep. So I know you said you didn't want to go into detail about security keys, but Yeah, sure. Uh, I can talk about that. So basically, we have these event logs, and the idea is the event should only be going in one direction, you know, much like the band. Uh, meter readings should only be going from the ground to the cloud. And I don't know, like user information typically only goes from the cloud to the ground. If you have something that needs to reconcile the differences between those two, um, and you have directions going in two ways, you make a separate event. Uh, and then you look at the two and you do the conflict resolution that way. So you don't have like a single resource that you're updating from both the cloud and the ground. And you don't have this shared resource and you don't have that shared conflict. John. Uh, failure rate, like because we tried to write and it, it failed, or like we're using EMMC too much? Like if you're using EMMC a hundred years from now, writing X amount of logs per second for the variation. Uh, I would love to do that. It's definitely been a question and a concern, so short answer, no. Um, we do write, I mean, basically, we have to deal with power outages, so the assumption we have is like power could go out at any time. So, um, we write a lot to disk, unfortunately, because of that. Um, so there is this question about how long is the lifespan. Fortunately, our disks are fairly large size, so I think that helps also. Um, but it is a question for sure. Yeah, immediately write. So for example, you know, we have let's say something comes in and it, it causes us to change the state of a meter. We want to know that we changed that state. Um, we don't want to like keep that in memory and have a chance that we lose it. So we err on the side of just writing too much. Uh, but that also, you know, writes slow down the system. So it's also a concern. So you're generating Avro and Elixir? Is there a library where you're using for that? Yeah, there's something called Earl Avro, um, which we've had pretty good luck with. Yeah, Avro's great. I like it a lot. Um, it's nice to have guarantees uh, on this like schema, which is, so we define the schema for the events, and sometimes it'll get through like something else, but then the schema will give us an error, so it's just like one more nice check uh, on our data. Yes, sir. Uh, focusing on the uh, actual meter aspect, you mentioned, uh, if I heard you correctly, you're actually controlling power a little bit. Are you doing things like manage response or anything more active? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so some of the things we'll do is like, if a site has solar panels and a diesel generator, they'll do scheduled um, usage, basically. So electricity will cost more during cert certain parts, parts of the day, which is when the generator's running, and it'll cost less when they can use the solar panels. Um, so that's part of the software. Um, we don't, I don't think we do anything dynamically with that. Um, I'm sure it's probably in the pipeline. Um, but then we have, there are, there's the ability to set dynamically the load limit, how much power you can draw from the meter. Uh, and the reason is just because, uh, you know, you might not have enough power to serve everybody in the same site uh, with just the, the amount that 
uh, if it's like a, a microgrid, which is not connected to the main grid, you might, they might, this site might have like 20 solar panels and they're, the amount of energy that I can give to anybody at a certain time is capped. Uh, so that's the gist there. But. So these are not passive devices? No, they're very active. There is a lot that happens on the device and in the cloud, uh, which is, makes my job very interesting. Isaac. Sure. Uh, uh, I put solar on my house and Texas has a deregulated so I can sell back power to the <laughs> system. Can I buy your company's system and run it on my own, inside my own house and use it for garbage doable things? Because <laughs> uh, I would love to hack on my own house. <laughs> that is an interesting question. Um, I'm sure our marketing would have like some sort of a lot of questions for you on that, but uh, you know the short answer is it wouldn't be worth it for you. A lot of this is basically um, keeping track of usage per customer and figuring out who to bill and keeping uh, operations going. But interesting idea. Um, nerves. Anything you want to do with monitoring nerves is great. So that's how I would spin it. I also know we got to get to lunch. I'm happy. To, I'm happy to take questions forever, but don't feel bad if you guys want to head to lunch. We're probably at time, anyways. Thanks.